Howdy folks, today we're going to be talking about how to price your photography the right way and how to find clients who are willing to pay you what you're worth, right after this. Welcome to Camera Shake, where we bring you the insider scoop on all things photography and videography, giving you a unique opportunity to stay ahead of the curve. We've spent literally hundreds of hours interviewing some of the most renowned photographers of our time, giving you access to knowledge and expertise that's not available anywhere else. As always, I'm your host, Kirsten Nutz, and if you enjoy this content, consider lending your support on buymeacoffee.com forward slash camera shake to help us create more exciting episodes for you. Your support really does make a difference. But without further ado, let's give it up for today's special guest, photography business guru and the founder of Happily Ever Photo. Please give it up for Bonnie Sindelar. Bonnie, how are you? Thank you. I mean, that was very flattering introduction. I don't feel like I'm quite up to that level, but I appreciate it. <laughs> I'm actually, you know, the first thing I was wondering is like whether I pronounced your name correctly. Is it, it is Cindelar, is it? That's it. Yeah. You're one of the few people who did it right on the first try. Oh, cool. That's what we're known for on this show. <laughs> Not exactly. <laughs> um, th yes. Thank you so much for coming to the show. Um, uh, I know you're based in Nebraska. What time is it where you are right now? Uh, it is 3.04 p.m. Oh, okay. That's very civilized. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> um, Bonnie, I've introduced you uh, basically as a, a, a business pricing guru, and that's what we want to talk about today. And you've also um, I mentioned you the founder of Happily Ever Photo, which uh, in itself is a unique idea. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a photographer directory that allows you to basically find the perfect photographer for your needs. Um, and we'll... Uh, we'll get into that. I, th I have a feeling that uh, our conversation about pricing and how to price your services, uh, you know, correctly, I think that's going to flow into that because, um, uh, yeah, I think that's a very uh, interesting conversation ahead. Um, my first question for you would be, I know pricing in photography is something that's incredibly difficult for anybody getting into the business in the first place because the question is always like, well, how much? do I actually charge for this? Like how, how much am I worth? And with that comes a lot of, you know, a lot of issues of self-confidence, self-esteem, you know, and then also, you know, how do you, well, how do you figure out how much to charge? Like, so what would you say, what, what's, what's the, what is the approach when it comes to pricing your, your own photography? Okay. So first of all, I want to say that I have seen so many posts on Facebook groups that they just like put their put their photos out and it's usually a woman I can't I can't say men don't do this but I generally see women doing this um, they put their photos out to the community and they say hey you know I'm new to this what do you think I should charge and that is like the absolute worst way to do it and I see other people giving advice like oh just go with whatever the average of you know what people in your area are charging and, and choose that which is also terrible advice. Um, I think partially because um, there is no industry standard for what we do, right? This isn't something where you have like an expectation where everyone knows, okay, I'm going to go get a car, you know, of this type and this size and this mileage, and it's going to cost me like around this much. And, you, and that's kind of like standard no matter where you go. But photography is so vastly different, not just from state to state or country to country, but from you know, one person on the same street as the other photographer. And some of it, I agree, I understand, has to do with their own, the own photographer's personal financial needs, right? Not that I'm saying that's a good way to choose your pricing, but that is what a lot of people use to explain why they charge differently as well. You know, we don't actually need the money, you know, or this is just kind of a hobby, um, so I don't charge as much. Um, which isn't a good way to go about it. But what I suggest is um, kind of multi-steps, but I try to make it as simple as possible that if you take, for example, I don't know, you know, we're different countries, so it's a little bit different, but I'm in Nebraska, which is like kind of a cheap area to live in the US. And you can still go down the street and find a $15 per hour job um, with no skills whatsoever, you know, working in a coffee shop or a fast food restaurant or something like that. And at the very, very least, if even if you don't need the money, 
you should at least be charging what boils down to that amount, right? Like you should never be working for less than what a completely unskilled person should work for. And people don't understand how to get to that number as far as what they charge, because a lot of photographers come into the business because again, the vast majority of photographers who are going into the business now do not have a business education, a photography education. Nobody has explained this stuff to them. So they're just kind of like making it up as they go along, or they're getting this, you know, terrible advice from Facebook or comparing themselves to other people in the industry who are not charging enough. Um, but you should go into it and know, okay, this is the average amount of hours that I want to work. And this is, you know, the, about the amount of time that I'm going to be spending per session. And this is the amount of money that I want to make. And this is the number of weeks that I want to work per year. And I have a calculator now that you can just take those small things and you don't have to know your exact expenses about, you know, what's your CRM going to cost and what's your cost of goods going to be for the things that you're selling and all these, you know, what are your utilities and your rent and all this stuff. You don't need to know those. We're taking essentially the industry average that has been reported by professional photographers and we're, you know, inserting your numbers into that calculation to give you uh, like a relative starting point um, to make what you want to make. So yeah, that's, that was kind of a long winded answer, but <laughs> yeah. So basically to boil it down, kind of take two industry standards in order to help you calculate it. So the average take home percent that a photographer takes home after they take out their overhead and their taxes. And again, I'm here in the US, so I know it's different everywhere. Um, but that usually ranges somewhere between 30 and 50% that you get to take home after your overhead for your business and all your taxes are taken out. So we use that number. And then also, um, what percent of time of all of your business hours that you're doing is actually spent on shooting a session? And this is the most misunderstood number. I mean, even in like people who have been in the business forever, if they have never actually looked and done this math, it's shocking. It was shocking to me. And I heard it when I was like seven years into business. So they pulled multiple, I mean, they pulled many, many photographers. One of the ones I read said 4% of your total working time is actually shooting sessions. When I pulled the photographers on my website, our average came out to be about 8%. Um, so if you estimate, you know, maybe somewhere between five to 10% of your time is spent shooting, then you can take all these other numbers that you put into the system and use that to calculate how much time out of the total amount of time you have to work on your business, you can actually work on shooting. And then if you know, okay, my average sessions, say you're a wedding photographer, I'm usually spending eight hours, you know, shooting on a specific day, then you can take your total time, multiply that by, you know, that percentage that you're actually going to have to shoot and then divide that by eight and you'll get your total number of weddings that you essentially have the capacity to shoot in the year, given your time constraint. So, um, it sounds complicated. It's really not that complicated. Um, but it's a big surprise to a lot of people, I think, because a lot of times people will come at it and they'll say, okay, you know, to a new photographer, well, how many sessions do you want to shoot? And it's like, well, they don't have any idea what that translates to, because I could say, oh, I, I could totally shoot you know, 10 sessions a week. Cause that's only, if I do one hour, sessions, that's only 10 hours. I've got 30 other hours in the whole week to do my other stuff. And that's completely unrealistic, you know, based on many, many photographers who are in the business and give their feedback. Like that's not, unless you outsource literally everything that is absolutely not feasible. And if you outsource literally everything, then obviously your expenses are going to be way higher. So it's just not um, a realistic number to come in with. So it's a big shock, I think, for a lot of people who are starting the business to think like, oh, this one hour session that I'm making $500, that means that I'm making $500 an hour. <laughs> yeah. No and that, you know, psychologically, psychologically, that's, I think that's the obstacle very often, especially for people, you know, coming into the industry, um, you know, because it feels like you're charging $500 or whatever an hour. Um, and yet you're not because you know, that is just 
the time you may be spending with the client, but everything else that goes around that. Not only not only the, the time post processing, for instance, the images and delivering them and all that kind of stuff, but just running the business. And I always say, you know, I, I always think when I'm shooting, I'm sort of making money, but when I'm editing, I'm losing money. You know, in a sense, because because that's the time where I'm not actually really making money. I'm just you know, I'm just processing the images that I've already sold in many in, in a weird way. You know, so I always think like, uh, you know, if I can streamline that process and I can actually get to more shooting, then, you know, then I can in fact bring in more sessions a week and therefore I can, I can then maximize my profits. Um, that was until this goes back a few years. Um, I had an experience with a friend of mine who's a headshot. One of the things I do a lot of is headshots. So I'm over here in the UK and, um, I used to do what a lot of photographers in that space do which is I uh, used to sell packages. And we'll talk about that in, in a second in more detail. Um, but, you know, I used to do the, the standard thing. I had like a low-cost package and a sort of medium-tier package and like a more of a luxury type of package, and you know. And uh, and then a friend of mine um, looked at my website and uh, he said like, look, man, you're totally undercharging. Like there's, you know, there's no question about that. And I, like many people, I to think, well, that's all well and good, you know, but in my market, you know, if I look at the competition, blah, 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 because it's the common, you know, the common thing. The areas to think like, well, but like, I can't, like, I can't be charging twi- three times as much as, as the next guy down the road, you know. Um, but then I changed the way that I, that I charge for my sessions entirely because I, I, since then, I haven't done packages. I basically just um, I charge for a session fee plus a photo fee on top. And what that means is my session is worth this much, um, considerably more than I used to charge for even the, the mid-sized package. And, um, and there's no time limit on it. And so what that means is I can basically run through as many looks as the client allows me because it's basically down to their availability. You know, some clients need a quick headshot and that's it, and other clients have time, especially acting clients, for example, if they need to put a portfolio together, they might go through 10 different looks. And the more looks I can get through, the more I can profit off that particular session. I'm putting in more time, but I'm also making the session itself more, more profitable. So for me, what that's meant, if I, when I looked at the numbers, first of all, I realized, okay, now that I'm charging three times as much as I did before, I only need to find a third of the clients, you know, and they are different clients. That's uh, something I've, I've noticed. You know, the, those clients are different clients. Those are the clients that are prepared to pay them more. You know, the, the, the kind of phone calls that I get um, asking for a super cheap, like, I don't know, in, in, in US dollars, like a 60 buck headshot. I happily pass them on to somebody else. And that's, you know, it's, it's a glorified passport photo. That's cool. But that's not what I do. That's just, uh, you know, it's like go to Ferrari garage, garage. Um, car dealership, I guess you call it, um, and you know, asking for you know a car that's priced more like a small VW or something. You know, it's just, it's just not you know you're just not in the right place, and that's that's okay. Um, so that that was my experience. So how do you feel about those photographers who are charging very little? Because everybody has an idea about this. You know, some photographers are are really angry at those people when they say like, you're the reason why, you know, photographers are in the situation that we're in. And other people say there needs to be a price point for everybody. I don't know, where do you fall on that spectrum? So, I mean, I do think that, um, you know, um, lowballing, especially pricing is a race to the bottom in the grand scheme of things. Um, obviously it is, and it sort of, you know, devalues the industry as a whole. Um, and as headshot photographers in particular, or portrait photographers, you know, we've, we're facing a completely different problem that's AI based because there are plenty of, uh, you know, AI uh, apps around or have, have sort of popped up over the last, I don't know, six, nine months or something that allow you to do, to create a pretty decent looking headshot. You know, if you need something like for your LinkedIn profile or something like that. Yeah. I mean, you could do it like, how much does that cost? I don't know, a couple of bucks, you know, maybe like, a, I don't know, you know, I mean, it, nothing basically in comparison and you can do it by yourself. No, the difference there is, is I think um, that as different new situations present themselves, whether that's competition trying to, you know, drop the, the, the price out of the bottom of the market or whether it's new 
uh, developments like AI. Um, it just simply means that the market is changing. You have to react to it, just like any small business would have to. I mean, it doesn't really make a difference whether you're running a bakery and you're selling bread and somebody else sets up next to you and sells bread for half the price. You're going to have to react to that somehow. And, um, you know, that usually means, in, in my case, it just it just means that, you know, those people who use an app to do their to do their headshot or those people who want to pay 60 bucks for headshot, they're just simply not my clients. But that's cool. You know, there's clients out there for everyone. They're just not mine, you know, and uh, it just means that I have to take responsibility as a business owner um, in, you know, looking for clients elsewhere, you know, and uh, and it's, it's the old, you know, marketing strategy of like creating an avatar of your perfect client and so on, you know, so on and so forth. Because the one thing, I think there's a couple of things that will never change regard, regardless of technological developments or whatever, you know, there are people who are looking for quality. You know, there are people who are looking for the Bentleys and the Rolls Royce or the BMWs or whatever, and there are people who are looking for the cheap cars. That's also cool because that's what the situation is. You know, it's there's a car for everyone. You know, there's a fit for everyone basically. And the same thing is true for for headshot photography. Um, and so it's just it's just about creating that match. You know, between the right client um, and and what I do and also has obviously has an impact on how I shoot my sessions and what I offer and how I do it and how I present it. Of course it does because the clients are different. So, um, yeah, but it's reacting to a change in the industry. Um, and I think it's the same in, in any business environment. And if you don't react to those changes in the market, then you have a problem, you know? Yeah. And I think, um, a way that our industry is a little bit different from kind of like the car industry is that now people who are buying cars, like the person who is buying the, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a, a, a cheap, a super cheap car, is not expecting the same quality as a person who's yeah. going, you know, and buying something really expensive. Unfortunately, in the photography world, we have a incredibly good quality photographers who are charging next to nothing, you know, yes. for, for their own reasons, but they're all, often similar reasons. Um, and so now we're almost training the public to think that all photographers should be at this low point and these more expensive ones are not more expensive because they're higher quality or get, give you a better experience or whatever, but just because they're scam artists, essentially. Because if all these other photographers, including the really great ones, can charge this low rate, then there there's no justification for this person who is out here charging more. And I think that's where it really hurts us. And all of the damage that's been done to the public's perception on photographers has been done by photographers. Like we are the cause of it, right? We are the ones who have dropped our rates to that low amount. And sent this message out to the public. And I think one of the reasons that we've dropped our rates is because digital photography has made it so, you know, if you had a film camera back in the day, I'm old enough that I started on film, <laughs> you had, you know, those 24 shots that you could take and your fingers crossed, you know, based on all the settings that you had on your camera, you, you got some good ones in there and you can't just sit there and put put in more rolls of film and more rolls of film and take a thousand photos to get that one good one because it's way too expensive. But now in digital photography, someone can go out, take a thousand photos, get 10 great ones. And, and, and now they're a photographer, you know? So it, the education is no longer there anymore because people don't feel like they need it. You know, if they can just hit volume, you know, take enough photos, they're going to get enough good ones that it's going to work out. They don't have to sit there and learn the ins and outs of their camera anymore. Now, obviously, we know that that makes your photos way better, but to the public's eye, most people in the public cannot tell the difference between a great technical photo and a, a mediocre or even a bad one. So we're going out there and there's no education. And so I think in our minds, we know that we haven't put in the time or the money. We haven't put in all of this you know, investment that would bring the inherent value of what we're doing up. And so we go, and even if we have a master's degree in some other field, and we've put in all this time to education, if it wasn't towards photography, and I'm speaking as a woman, I can't speak to, you know, 
the majority of men or even I can't speak to all women, obviously, but I think it happens more in, in a women, woman's mind that it's like, well, I'm not I'm not worth it. Right. Because I didn't do all these things to deserve to, to charge this much. Right. And then we see all these other photographers out there who are feeling the exact same way, who are, you know, this vicious cycle of other photographers telling them that that's what they should be charging. And then the public saying, well, we're not going to go to you because you're too expensive. And then they the lower their rates more. And it's like this snowball effect that it just is keeping us in this cycle to where I really feel like we're in this dichotomy of you either have to be a phenomenal salesperson um, and then you can do great in the high, you know, luxury end of photography, or you've like, you're, you're competing with all the other, these other people at the bottom because there are so many great photographers who are at the bottom price point. And it's just, it's making it really interesting in the photography industry as well as far as trying to sustain a, you know, a livable wage. Do you think that's um, that's something that's predominantly been happening since the event of digital photography, or, or um, do you think there was a trend to that before that already? Um, I don't know. And in, in my mind, when I was growing up in the film photography, and everyone was, it was kind of like right when I was graduating high school, was right on the cusp of when you know, the photographers were pushing back and, oh, we're never going to go to digital because they're never going to be as good a quality, you know, but they were slowly turning over. But in my mind, so many more of the photographers back then were men. And I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what it seemed like to me. And now, at least in my space, and I shoot mostly maternity and family stuff. I mean, 95% of us are women. Um, so that colors my reaction a little bit, but I do, I mean, I really do feel like it has trended with the digital turnover because I don't know, it's just before you couldn't just jump into film photography and start a business. There were so many educational and technical aspects that cost a lot of money. You know, um, you were, maybe not developing your own film, but you were sending them out to get developed. You know, there were all these extra costs. In-person sales was like the only way you did it, right? You weren't selling online. So you had Oof. all these extra time and cost components to what you were doing. So you just, you had to charge a certain amount or you couldn't stay in business. And now digital photography, if you really want to make what we do cheap and make your overhead low, I mean, you can't get it to zero, obviously, but you can get it pretty low and people use that to justify in their minds why they can charge what they do when they're not really doing the math in, you know, completely. But yeah, I mean, maybe it was starting before that, but I saw it much more when the whole digital revolution came about. Hey, let me just jump in real quick to tell you about the amazing sponsor of this episode, Platypod. Platypod offers innovative camera support systems designed to unleash your creativity. With their stable, versatile, and portable solutions, you can capture stunning shots like never before. And I'm not just saying that. As the host of the Camera Shake podcast, I can personally vouch for Platypod's incredible products. They've become an integral part of the show. In fact, I'm surrounded by various Platypod products holding up lights, cameras, microphones, and so on. It's really helped to transform the way I make the show and the way I shoot at home, in the studio, and on location. But don't just take my word for it. Explore Platypod's website at www.platypod.com to discover their range of products, including the Platypod Extreme, Platyball Tripod Heads, and the brand new handle, of course. Make sure to follow Platypod on Instagram and Facebook at Platypod Tripods for exclusive updates, tips, and giveaways. By choosing Platypod, you're not only investing in your photography, but you're also supporting the Camera Shake Photography Podcast. Thanks again to Platypod, our amazing sponsor. Platypod, where innovation never sleeps. And I think, you know, on the flip side also, um, you know, now, it, in a sense, running your own business just in general has become so much more complicated because, you know, just being, just being a great photographer isn't just isn't good enough in a sense anymore because now we need to be, you know, web designers almost, you know, we need to be social media experts, you know, we, we need to do all of that stuff that was you know, that previously wasn't really necessary, you know, in, in the time before social media, you know, we put a shekel out basically, 
working outside the house and be like, hey, photography business, <laughs> come and it's you know, so come true. And have it's so true. Yeah, because I mean, the cost of having a business was so much more expensive. You had to have like the studio space. When people had these brick and mortar stores, it was so much more expensive to run a business. And so you didn't have a million photographers along, you know, in town who were all doing what that person was doing. You literally had your studio space and your sign on your studio and that was your marketing. You know, the people drove by in town and they saw your sign and you were that person. And now it's, yeah, like you said, it's completely different. You have to have, wear so many hats to be a photographer now. Yeah, it's it's sometimes it can be quite overwhelming. I think you know having to wear this this many hats because you know it's 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 it, it seems you know you're going to write blogs and you know do this and then the other in order to to get your message out there. You know, uh, let alone doing things like I don't know YouTube or or any of these things that previously you know it, it's like it feels like there's almost a necessity to be on camera as much as as it is you know to be behind the camera now and it's it just you know it feels it feels crazy so uh, it's much more of a sort of multifaceted job and yet despite the fact that it seems like we have so many additional things that we need to put into the business um the rewards seem to lessen you know over time yes i agree and I would be really interested. I don't know if you know if there's any data out there to look at, you know, the average income of a professional photographer, say, I don't know, even 30 years ago versus now and, you know, adjusted for inflation and everything and what that equates to. Because, I mean, I feel like it's got to have plummeted in my mind. It seems like it's just way lower. Like, it's just, I, I don't even know what percent of photographers actually sustain themselves much less their spouse and their kids on the photographer salary but it's i feel like it's got to be in the single digits as far as percent goes and again i'm in the u.s yeah. so i don't know if it's different there but yeah it's very low it's i think it's not too dissimilar over here in the uk and that's that's the impression that i have um you know i mean it's interesting um as i've talked about this on, on the show you know a few times in the past but it's interesting you know talking to people who were let's say wedding photographers back in the 80s you know um, it was such a different game back then. Like, I have friends who used to basically shoot three weddings a day. You know, one in the morning, one in the afternoon at the registry office, and then one in the evening with the whole, you know, the whole party, the whole shebang. And it, but they deliver an album of 25 to 35 images. That was it. And, you know, they, they would most likely develop the, the images on the same day. And if I've heard stories of like people setting up a back room basically and developing it there. So essentially, you know, they'll be just like shooting, then developing the film. And, be, and they'll be pretty much done and dusted within a day or so. You know, nowadays, but then they'll be shooting considerably fewer images, you know, because, because it was on a film. And now, if you think about it, like, you know, now you're like, you're shooting. Like if you're doing an eight-hour wedding, I mean, how many how many images do you shoot? I'm not a wedding photographer. I'm guessing like three thousand, four thousand. I don't know. We have thousands of images, you know, that you then have to cull and edit and da da. And then you're delivering, and I know this from my own wedding. Like then you're delivering like a thousand images. Like who the heck d delivers a thousand images? <laughs> do you know, what I, mean? I would have been completely unthinkable in the in the eighties. Um, and you know, That's and spending so true. Like, you know, and, and spending like three days or something. Uh, or whatever editing editing images yeah. it's just you know that's insanity because you can't you can't shoot other weddings <laughs> in that time you know yeah and the expectation i think from the public of how many photos they need from a session has just skyrocketed i mean in family photography too i remember i get so many inquiries that are like oh you know our previous photographer we did an hour session and she just gave us all the images and it was like 150 images i'm like nobody needs 150 images for a family session you just don't you know but it's yeah. like people get mad when that's not something that you deliver and it's like well, okay how many of these are you going to print much less put on your walls I, no what's going to happen is they're going to get lost you're probably going to download half of them and then the ones that you do download are going to get lost somewhere you know in a folder and then your computer's going to crash and then you're going to be emailing your photographer five years later asking for you know if they still have your photos and it's like no you do not need 150 photos and like in weddings you do not need 600 or whatever we got from our wedding it's like yeah, yeah. it's nice to have a variety i'd probably like to have more than 25 but 
But yeah, the expectations are just are vastly different than they were back yeah. then. And I love it when I head to a client. I mean, it doesn't happen very often, to be honest with you, but occasionally I have, I have a client who goes like, oh, can you send me all the all the photos you shot today? Uh, no. <laughs> like, why would I do that? You know, that's where you pay me to, to like retouch them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're going to get the, the best of the best. That's why we're sitting here picking out the photos that, that you know, because that's one of the things I do. Uh, one of the things that I um, sort of, I started doing is um, I, I avoid digital galleries or online galleries you know, um, because it just prolongs the process. Because by the time, by the time the clients had the time to like figure out which shot they want or which shots they want, you know, um, it just takes absolutely forever. And I need, you know, with the workload that I have, I need that session to be out the door and done and dusted, you know, within preferably on the same day. So, um, so I spend the time, um, as part of the session in, in basically um, whittling all the images down to the hero shot for each look. And I also give, in a sense, I mean, it is a sales opportunity, you know, clearly, obviously, because it allows me to, to essentially, you know, guide them through the process. But basically what it means is by the time the client leaves, I know exactly which images go into retouching. And then those are the well, images that, that they, sorry. Yeah. I was going to say that that's, that's genius too, because you also get their feedback in real time. So if there's something that they don't like about the photo that you may not have noticed or even, you know, cared about or thought it was bad, they can tell you in real time, oh, we need to change this. And then you can take more photos to yeah, make that Yeah, that's a huge better. part of it. I tell you, that's a huge part of it. Because what, what I do actually is, um, it is a typical sort of thing in a session. Um, I, I mean, first of all, I have a conversation with them before the session. Um, so we'll sit down, have a cup of coffee, you know, just talk about, things i find out what they do what their background is i'll take a little bit of time to do that so i don't rush them through the process which is why i don't do 20 minute sessions there's, there's no such thing as like coming in the door you know shoot some okay. pictures and then you know that's i just don't do this just stop my thing um so i like to make that connection first of all you know just that human connection between two people who have never met each other you know um but at the, t at the same time i'm finding out about who they are um, what they do in particular, especially if they're, um, if they're business headshots, um, I would shoot, you know, the CEO of a company in a completely different way that I would shoot somebody who's maybe a customer facing, you know, um, like a health professional or something like that, you know, as a, you know, or a lawyer, I would choose, I would shoot them in completely different ways. But in order for me to figure that out, I need to have a conversation with them in the first place. So that's the important part. But then when I start shooting, you know, I'll, and this is just based on the premise that this is a completely abnormal situation for any regular human being is being in front of like studio lights and somebody with a massive camera in your face and all that kind of stuff. It's completely abnormal, you know? Um, and so people are nervous, you know? And uh, yeah, I know as a photographer that I, you know, I don't get the best out of them when they're nervous at that point. So I need to essentially get them used to the process. So we'll shoot a little bit. I shoot, I don't know. I don't know, anywhere between 30 and 80 frames, something like that. You know, we have a little conversation, we shoot through it. Then I get them to come over and we look at the images on the screen. Um, and whilst they're looking at the screen, they're thinking they're doing sort of a pre-selection, I'm looking at them and I'm, I figure out what is it that they like and what is it that they don't like. Because they might not like the way their head is turned. And so these, you know, they'll, they'll, they won't pick these particular images. And so then when we get back when I get them back uh, in front of the camera, I know exactly, well, that's the one thing I'm going to avoid because I know they don't like that. And so, uh, you know, and so I whittle the whole thing down uh, throughout the process. And so by the time we're finished, they've actually had a great experience. And this is the thing that we talked about earlier, and it's just is creating an experience for a client um, where they really feel um, that they, you know, the, the images that they're looking at on the screen are like almost like a perfect version of themselves. And that's what gives them confidence. And so they, they walk out, I guess what I'm trying to say is they, they walk out more confident than they came in. And that's, you know, <laughs> that's a winner as far as I'm concerned. And you know, that's and such that's... a vulnerable space to be in as oh, someone completely. being photographed. It's like you walk in there, you don't know this person probably. You're getting yep. your photo taken. A lot of them don't show you what it looks like. And then you leave and you sit there at home and like wait, you know, for the result to come. And then once it comes, like it's too late to change it, right? You can't go back and make any adjustments yeah. to how you were standing or what you did with your hair or whatever. Uh, so yeah, your system is is genius. I can see why it 
very successful. I, yeah, I remember this. Like, do you, do you remember these? Um, I don't know if you've got this these little uh, photo booth shop things in the US, but basically here in the UK, if you want to have your passport photo taken, typically you go to like a little high street store, like a little photo shop, and they, you know, they camera, they sit, they place you in front of like a white background or something, they take a bunch of uh, shots, and then you've got to wait, they print them out right there and then, right? You've got to wait, but you haven't actually seen the image until they've printed them out. And then you look at them and you go, it's going to be in my passport for the next 10 years. Oh my God. You oh, know, and, uh, right, and that's, that's with, like, yeah. You know, and that's, that's the thing. Yeah, that's that's the thing. You know, now you've got this passport with <laughs> this horrible image of of yourself, and you got to look at that for ten years. You know, oh my god. So uh, you know, it's uh, I, I mean, personally, I can re I really feel for people when you know when they come in, and it, I mean, it, virtually almost every client will come in with the same words, and it's usually something like, oh. Um, I either I hate having my photo taken or I never look good in a photo. That's that's just a standard, you know. It's almost like before hello. <laughs> that's the first thing they say, you know. And then it's yes. yeah, that's yeah. Your example of the passports is exactly how like the DMV for our driver's licenses work, you know. And it's like usually it's not a very certainly not an experienced photographer, right? It's just a DMV employee, and they generally hate their jobs. So I was like, I'm not going to sit there and be, you know, like give you some extra time or attention or like give you some tips. They're going to be snap the photo done. And then, yeah, like you said, they just print it out right there. And as soon as you see it, you're like, oh God, <laughs> they could have told me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And the rest of your, you know, however long that driver's license lasts for is how long are you going to stare at that photo? And I find it, I had that, ex that very experience actually at Costco not too long ago because they do, you know, when you renew your membership card and they just have a little webcam. Like you go to the customer service desk, they have this little webcam, and they just go, you know, look at the camera. And they just you know, press a button on the computer, and it's like, it's black and white, and it's freaking grainy, and then, you know, oh, man. So uh, the last time I went, I actually went with my wife, and we both had our cards done at the same time. And so uh, I just went into total photographer mode. I was like, I right, stand here, darling, <laughs> slip your chin out till the end a little bit, you know. And he, uh, the Costco lady was just looking at me, going like, what the hell? But, you know, it's just, ugh. It's a terrible experience for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, do you think that any, like, uh, I mean, generally, we, we talked a little bit about uh, industry trends, you know, impacting on pricing. But as an industry as a whole, what can we do to, to, sort of, to remedy that situation in the future? Yeah. So, okay. I think the first step, if, if someone is not charging enough because they don't feel like, they're, you know, quote unquote, good enough, then my first step would be go back, step back, don't charge anything, essentially put yourself back in school and just educate yourself, you know, and you don't have to do it formally anymore, right? You can do YouTube, you can do podcasts, you could do workshops. There are a million different ways that you can technically educate yourself as a photographer, but do that first because that is going to give you so much more confidence in the consistency of what you produce, um, in your value, right? Because you have invested this time and money into this education. So just in the back of your mind, all of a sudden your time is worth more. Um, and then after you've done that, just practice and practice and practice. And I am a hundred percent for not charging anything while you're doing this you know you are doing model calls you are practicing on friends and family all of this stuff that you're doing is completely free and it's just like i said just like going to school and you are just putting in your time and you're you're learning things obviously with every session not just technically and lighting wise but okay how do i need to interact with with these type of people or you know what are the certain prompts that i can give that will get this kind of reaction and it's just every single session you're getting better and better and better and you finally get to the point where, in my mind, when you can produce a consistent portfolio where you know that no matter if it's a cloudy day or a sunny day, or you're in a new location or an old location, that you can produce the same quality of work and you know all your numbers. So you know, okay, this is how much time I spend on this. This is how much you know time that I'm willing to put into this you know, per week. And you know all these numbers and you know how like how much money it costs you to do certain things, then you put all that into a calculator, you figure out exactly what you need to charge to make what you want to make, and then you just go 
full in. Like it's just a hundred percent or nothing, you know, cause what is the point of coming in and charging a hundred dollars, you know, for an all-inclusive family session, because you're just, you're shooting yourself in the foot and you're like, we were talking about, you're hurting the industry in general, because what are you going to do now? You know, after you have all these clients who are paying you a hundred dollars, wh what are they going to do when you raise it to 800 and a thousand, you're going to lose all of them. So you're just going to yeah. have to start from scratch anyways. What's the point? Like, there's just no point. You know what you need to charge. You know your worth. You know that you've put in the time. You have consistent results. Like, just do it. It's just not math. It's not emotional. It doesn't lie to you. It just is what it is. You know, so you can sit there and lie to yourself as much as you want. Or like, oh, you know, maybe I'll just, you know, take a little, maybe I don't need to actually make that much money. Or maybe I don't, you know, like, just don't do that. Just put that all aside. And this is the math. This is what I need to charge. And I am a hundred percent. If photographers need to get a second job, a part-time job, even a full-time job in order to make the money that they need to make to support whoever they need to support, I am a hundred percent on board with that. I think I see so yeah. many photographers going into desperation mode where they have left their job and, you know, because somebody told them that, you know, photography is easy and you can make $500 an hour, you know, and on and on and on. And they jump into it and they realize it's nothing like that. And then they're desperate. And then they start dropping their prices. And then they start shooting things that they don't want to shoot. And it's it, it just ends up horribly. So if you can get another job, assuming you need the money to where you can be making that money, then you're not feeling that pressure of those clients accepting you. You know, that when an inquiry comes in, and they say you're too expensive, just like, all right, cool. Like you do, peace out. Here's another photographer who's cheaper or, you know, maybe yeah. go to someone who's friends and family and they're learning or wh however you want to treat that situation. But you're not sitting there and trying to get that client by undervaluing yourself. So I think that's huge. Yeah. The, the education and the shooting, just putting in the time. And then, man, we have to, we have to educate other photographers. Like this is so huge. We are, I don't know how many Facebook forums you spend time in, but it's when people go on and they say like, oh, you know, here's my pricing guide. I'm new. And they put up a pricing guide. That's like, you know, a hundred dollars for a full family session. They get completely opposite reactions. They get the reactions from the people who are charging that much already. And they don't want to admit, you know, that it, it's not accomplishing anything. And they're like, oh yeah, that's what I charge, you know? And so that looks pretty good. And then you get the complete polar opposite people who are saying, you're working for less than minimum wage. You're, you know, devaluing the industry. You know, why would you do that to yourself? Blah, blah, blah. And without guidance and education, nothing, none of that is helpful. Like what people need to be coming in and doing, and some are doing it now. I see a couple, there's a couple people that I see, you know, who are constantly kind of inserting themselves on these conversations, but what you need to come in and say like, Hey, here is a very, like a blog post, or here is a pricing calculator, or here is, you know, a quick explanation for why that price will lead you to dollar fifty an hour, you know, wage or whatever, and give them the explanation, not in a you know, judgmental looking down on someone way, but just like, we've all been there. I mean, maybe not all of us, but the vast majority of us have been yeah. there, not understanding what this pricing means and what it amounts to. And so have some empathy for these people. Certainly don't, don't uh, allow them to keep thinking that they're charging a good price, right? Like come in there and show them that it's not going to work, but show them why and how don't just sit there and berate them and then walk away because that's not helping anybody. So yeah, that would be my, my two big pieces of advice. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting thing because, you know, in, in principle, what we've been talking about, um, with regards to pricing is uh, also totally applies to licensing, you know, when you get to the point where you license, uh, images, for example, and I think the vast majority of, of sure. people in my experience, um, just don't have any idea what the value of license licensing images actually is. Um, and I always um, sort of signpost people to a, to an online tool, like a, a, a licensing calculator. Um, and uh, it's, it's really interesting, you know, when you, when you put your numbers in, 
uh, and you realize how much money you can actually charge to license out, you know, some of your shots. Um, and I, I remember the first time years ago, the first time I looked at that and I thought, like, what? Like, that can't be right. Really? <laughs> that's insane. But, you know, but that's, that's how it is. But it's, that's another thing, you know, it's, it's just this, um, you know, this idea that, you know, once you've, once you've sold the shot, that's it, you know, there's, there's no, you know, no comeback after that. Uh, but then it's just simply the idea of licensing out images and then actually realize what the value is in that. And, and also, um, there's a similar problem with sort of, you know, taking the value of that out of the industry where like people say, okay, well, you know, you pay me the session fee and you can have all the photos for, you know, an infinite amount of time. And that's it. And you just go, well, that's not, no, like that's, that's not how the industry works really, you know, and also, um, I think when you, as a commercial photographer in particular, if you, once you get to a certain point, licensing is a humongous chunk of your of your annual income. You know, it's an important part of your of your business. I want to think, you know, likewise, that's something that's that very often uh, gets forgotten about or, or, or is misunderstood. You know, especially maybe for people who are either coming new into the industry or uh, or changing from one part of of the industry where licensing maybe it's not so much of an issue into maybe more of a commercial space where all of a sudden it is. Yeah. So when you're talking about licensing, are you meaning like if this company decides to use your work to promote something or are you talking about like, um, like stock photo kind of stuff? No, so I'm talking about, yeah, I'm talking about, um, you know, the, the primary use and the and secondary or, or, uh, ongoing uses of, of your work. So for instance, yeah, a good example would be like, for, for those for those listening who are not maybe not necessarily aware of what licensing means. So basically, you know, it could be a good example is, um, I give you a real world example of, of something that's, um, that I had to deal with um, a little while ago. So, um, I shot headshots for a company, um, for the whole team. And, uh, the prior use of that was to create headshots for their website, um, for their, you know, about us page basically. Um, and that's, that was the primary use of that session. That's what I got paid for and so on. Um, about a year on from that, um, they wanted to use some of those images for a billboard campaign, which is a completely different use of, of the intended use at the beginning. And then, of course, we're talking about licensing because now um, you got to remember that as a photographer, you hold the copyright to your work. Um, and the minute a client or somebody else, whoever, wants to use your images for another purpose that wasn't the intended primary purpose um, at the beginning, that's when you as a photographer or as, a, as the creator of that work are uh, rightly due to be compensated for that. And that's what licensing basically is, you know, and in a nutshell, that's so basically. That's interesting. Like, Sorry. So it's, yeah. So the way licensing works, if you think in, in sort of very simplistic terms, is essentially um, there's, there's three, um, what's the word, uh, there's three uh, main things to come into that you have to take into consideration. One is territory. So for instance, let's say take a billboard campaign, you know, is it a localized billboard campaign? Is it a national campaign? Is it an international campaign? Is it in Europe only? Is it worldwide? What is it? So the larger the territory, of course, um, that has an impact on the license fee. Um, you know, what is the intended use? Is it only, uh, a billboard campaign or is it an online and a print campaign? Is it what, whatever the, you know, a hundred different ways that that could go. Um, and then the third, uh, the third aspect is the, the time frame. So is that campaign, is that a campaign that's going to run over three months, six months, a year, two years, but you know, five years, that's, that's the thing. So all of these things are factors that you roll into the calculation in order to calculate what the business standard license fee should be that you as a photographer should be charging for, for to this company for the use of your images for this particular purpose in that territory and over that length of time. And because that's, because, you know, if you, if you come to that and you kind of go like, where do I even start with? I have no idea. Do I charge them a hundred pounds or dollars or, or a thousand? I don't know. I don't know. No idea. What is the industry standard? And there's some really great uh, online tools available that will basically allow to, to work out exactly what the industry standard is. And it's, it's very cut and dry and it's literally just, you know, what's your base rate? Yeah. You know, how much, how much did you charge for the, for the uh, initial session? And then what are the intended uses, how long, blah, 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 territory. And then it'll spits out an amount and that's, that's your starting point. It doesn't mean to say that this is how much you have to charge, but it basically gives you an idea as what the ballpark is. Like this is your starting, but usually 
usually the way it works is this this would be the starting point for you know some kind of conversation or you know, some kind of haggling with the clients you know it was like okay well this is where we start and then we can take from there you know um, and then of course it's, it's up to you how far you want to maneuver on that but you know that's in a in a nutshell that's how licensing works so how often does it happen that that client like doesn't even think to ask you about that because it it doesn't even occur to them that they would have to pay more to use their photos for something like that. Yes, a lot, and that's actually despite the fact that all of this is written very clearly in the initial contract. Right. But um, but unfortunately, uh, when you know when you work with corporate clients, like I've worked a lot with corporate clients, you know what happens? Like the marketing dude who booked you two years ago is now not there anymore. You know, and it's a new person, and they're not really going to look at. They're not going to dig out the original contract with those images. I mean, okay. most. A lot of people just don't, you know, because they don't think like that. They basically think, just like most people would intuitively think, well, I've paid for this thing once, so now it's mine. You know, and we find that not only in the photography industry, but also in the music industry, for instance, you know, in, in the, the lofty days of like of CDs, for instance. I mean, how many times have people buy CDs and then, you know, and then think, well, I now own that that music and, and now I can play it anywhere I want. And it's like, well, no, you can't because actually... <laughs> You know, somebody else is the creator of this work, and so there are copyright issues and all that. And that's basically, you know, what it what it comes down to. But it does happen a lot. I mean, in fact, you know, I mentioned this particular billboard campaign. Uh, I only I only found out about this when I saw that thing on the billboard. <laughs> you know, and uh, yeah, and then it's basically yeah, and it's 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 like you know, um, then you can do two things: either you can basically go, uh, well, that's really mean what they did, you know, or you can basically pick up the phone and call the client and basically say like, hey, I've noticed you know, you're running this billboard campaign. Um, I think you may have overlooked something. <laughs> so let's have a chat about that. But, you know, it's, um, but yeah, that's unfortunately it does happen a lot. Obviously yeah. it doesn't, it, you know, I mean, in a world yeah, where- Yeah, like you said with, I sorry, was no, gonna say now that you're delivering things, di you're delivering things digitally, yeah, it's so much easier to overlook that because you just think, well, I bought the digital file, so why would I have to? Yeah, I mean, that's all news to me. I, not that I've ever done that myself, but um, yeah, I would have never thought of that. And it really, and it's, it's quite understandable, actually. This is a really good example because, um, you know, you're, you said you're coming from a family photo, a newborn space, you know, and I, I predominantly work in a, um, in a commercial space. And so the things that are the standard sort of in, in the commercial photography space may not necessarily even be of consideration in, in, in another space. You know, wedding photography might be another good example. Um, you know, likewise, I probably don't know. I mean, if I, if I were to change into wedding photography, there'd be a lot of things I wouldn't have the first clue about, <laughs> you know, because, because that's just, it's just how it is. But yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, the, the minute you just think of it this way. I mean, the minute somebody uses your work to profit from, then you as the owner of the copyright of that work um, are, are now do some kind of compensation, essentially, because you know, they're using your work to profit from that. And it just makes sense that you get compensated for that. Um, and, and then that's called, that's called a license. And it's just a matter of negotiation. <laughs> you know? sure. sure and of course as with a lot of those things and it, this is actually you know talking about pricing you mentioned this, this is a very interesting thing actually because you said um, sometimes it's better to just take a step back and actually change no, uh, charge nothing and just practice and get good and I think that's really I, th I think that's so true that's actually something I find in a lot of conversations that I read especially online where people say like oh you should always charge I mean yeah don't do work for free because it takes the bottom out of the industry. And I always think like, man, that's, in my view, that's what, I do a lot of work for free. The, the difference is I choose when I want to do work for free. That's, you know, from, from a business perspective, that puts me in a driving seat and it allows me to make the decision. I do a lot of work for free. I don't always charge what it says on my website that I charge. Because there are circumstances where I may be charging less. I shouldn't say that. I always charge more. I always say this. This is just a bottom line. <laughs> no, but you know, the reality is <laughs> there are situations where you help out a friend, you know, or you have a barter arrangement. I had my kitchen tiled in in uh, you know uh, for a photo shoot, basically. That's I had my entire yeah. kitchen tiled 
um, you know, in a in a barter arrangement um, with the guy because you know the it's a, it's a little tile shop just next to my house basically, um, and yeah, uh, and you know we oh. we we were redoing our kitchen. I need somebody to tile the kit because I don't know the first thing about tiling kitchens. I'm like how does that work? No idea. So you know, I thought I hire an expert. And the guy comes in and he looks at the kitchen. He goes like, "Oh, you're a photographer." I'm like, uh, "Yeah, that's what I do." And he goes like, "Do you shoot food?" And I'm like, "Well, I guess I mean I can, you know, be an interesting thing. I have shot food before. It's not, I'm not a food photographer, a specialist or something, but yeah, it's, you know, like I can do." And he goes like, "Well, because I also own a restaurant and we've just changed our menu, and um, you know, so and then you know we discussed it and we came to an agreement, and yeah, they tiled our entire kitchen." I shot their menu. Everybody was happy. You know, no money exchange. Yeah. I love bartering. I think it's fantastic. I had um, the woman who does daycare for my son come to me and like say, you know, I don't want to offend you. I don't want you to think, you know, that I don't value what you do. But is there any way that you would be interested in, you know, exchanging what you would pay me for daycare, you know, to get family photos? And I'm like, yes, <laughs> of course I would. Like that's. Yeah. I'm 100% on board for that. If it's something that you already want or need, then yeah, bartering is awesome. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. You know, and then there's the, the other uh, the other side of things where sometimes, you know, it's just about actually just being a decent human being and helping somebody in need, you know. I a friend of mine um, started a new business and um, and uh, it's a funny story actually. He, uh, he it's a very good friend of mine and I've known him for years and he phoned me up one day and he goes like, I have to talk to you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I thought I'd talk to you first because I wouldn't be open with you, but I'm going to have headshots done by somebody else. Right. And they're like, just, that's totally fine with me. <laughs> you know, I'm not offended or anything. Um, bastard. Never mind. <laughs> but uh, uh, then he said, well, we won, my wife and I, we won a headshot session in a, um, what do you call it? Like a, a tombola type of a thing, right? Like some, something at some, some event or something. Um, and so they're going to go to this this headshot photographer and have have the headshots done. And I, you know, I thought, man, that's absolutely fine. You know, I'm not, like I said, I'm not offended. Again, bastard. But uh, yeah. <laughs> he's not watching this episode, by the way, so that's fine. But um, you know, and so they went and had the headshots done. And then a few a few weeks later, you know, we we spoke and and I said, how did the headshot session go? You know, are you happy with them? And he goes, like, man, it's a total disaster. They're terrible. They're absolutely terrible. Um, and uh, and he said, like, oh, and then, you know, and this, the guy, it was, it was a young guy, he was just starting out and something. And um, and he sent them the images, and, the, and there was such a low it, resolution that they were pixelating on the were, screen. And he asked them, he asked him whether he could send, uh, you, you know, a higher res version, and he refused, you know, because there's all this, this kerfuffle going on. And so I said, well, it's, I mean, send me the images, let me have a look, you know. Maybe, I don't know, maybe I can rescue them or something. No idea. Um, and he sent me the images and they were, truly were terrible. I mean, they were really terrible. I mean, I'm talking raccoon eyes. And I'm talking brick wall background. and it's, I mean, it's horrendous. Um, and, you know, I, didn't, I know, I knew he just started um, a realtor business. There was no, he had no money. There was no, you know, it's just at the beginning. And so I said, but him and his wife were really distraught about those, about those headshots. And they needed them because they just, you know, they're putting a new website together and, you know, and here in the UK, um, realtors often have their face on the signs, you know, when there's a sign, like a for sale sign out, you know, out, um, outside of a house, you know, you've got your face on there and it's, you know, I mean, they, that needs to look good. So I said, look, man, I, I can't look at this. This is terrible. <laughs> you know, do you, let's just come over <laughs> next week. We'll sort this out. <laughs> you know, and then, I did a session for them, you know, and it's fine. You know, I knew they, I knew they couldn't afford my rates, so, so it's okay. He bought me some drinks later on in the pub, I think. <laughs> but sometimes you have to do these things. And, That's just part of it. Yeah, and like you were saying, um, if you are charging, if you are already charging them out that you are making what you need to make, then you have the luxury to make those decisions and do that, and it doesn't cause you stress, you know, because you don't need that money so you don't feel like you're spending time doing something free when you could be spending time you know making money to pay your bills and so that's like a really important thing and so like you know going back to like having a fallback job or something 
that's one of the great benefits of it is you can do, you know, maybe if you come up with this really, I come up with these like creative photo ideas all the time. And so I'll do like a model call and do something really fun and creative that I would never have been asked to do, you know, by a client, but in my head, I just want to create this image and I can do that. And it's not stressful to me because I don't feel like, oh, you know, maybe I should find a way to monetize this somehow. You know, maybe I should give them one image and then charge them for some extra so I can justify my time and make money back. Like, I don't have to feel like that. And that's really wonderful for, you know, just my whole creative being and oh yeah and a non-confrontational person who doesn't like to sell themselves you know and like the idea of trying to get someone to buy something after i told them it was free does not feel good to me so yeah no, it's just that's a, great, a dangerous thing yeah, yeah this you know okay. and I was, I'm, a, I'm a big believer of karma you know um it's like you know what you the karma you spread around will essentially come in you know by doing the ass as they say you know yeah. and so if you're i think generally if you're you know, if you're a good person, you help you help others. That help will come around to you when you need it, and that's you know, it, because we're all running small businesses here. You never know when you're in need of of help from somewhere else. So it's I think you know, that's an important thing to to bear in mind. Of course, if you're at the point where you're not charging for your uh, for your photography anyway, then you know you could to lose. So it's even better. <laughs> you might as well take that as you know as a um, uh, you know as a thing as a thing to help others. Uh, personal projects. Uh, like you just mentioned, I'm a big believer in um, in doing personal projects for that very reason. Um, you know, it keeps your keeps your mind sharp. It keeps your your creativity ticking over. Um, you know, I don't know I don't know what it's like in in the newborn space, but but certainly in the headshot space, um, it can very quickly, especially in the, in this sort of corporate headshot space, it can very quickly become very formulaic. Um, you know, and there are certain shots you do a million times over you know and it's, it's not necessary you don't really feel like you're super creative doing them because you're um solving a problem for a client and that's you know that's the important thing to to bear in mind there. but so but personal so, projects are super important um i had a conversation with joel grimes um a while ago and the thing that really fascinated me about about him was that He's been in the business, I don't know, since the beginning of time, maybe since the Got dinosaurs it. were around, something like that. But he's been in the business for a very long time. Um, and he does a personal product every week. And he's always done that. And so it's not really surprising that he's as good as he is because he's just allowed his creativity. He's, he's a, he, you know, he's kind of fed his creativity over a very long period of time. And so, you know, that's a, it's a really, it's a really important aspect of what makes you, a, you know, a creative photographer, because it's you know you, there's the technical side and the practicing and all that kind of stuff, and then there's the creative side, and then of course then there's the interhuman side, especially if you're, um, you know, I mean, not so much if you're an arch architectural photographer, but certainly if you if you're photographing humans, then it's important to to build those skills as well. You know, to, to how do you, you know, how how do you interact with a client and or a model and and so so forth, um, and I mean that's actually that's exactly why, for instance, um, I don't show I don't shoot newborns because I just don't know how to interact with a newborn. <laughs> you know? hey, and that's wonderful for me as an introvert. Yeah. I don't have to interact with newborn, right? I don't have to like you know have a conversation with them, and so yeah, that that's one perk. And a lot of people who are also you know not super social with people go into like photographing dogs you know and then you're still yeah. you know kind of in the port genre but you're not having to sit there and have like small talk with with a bunch of people yeah absolutely well products you know during the pandemic for instance um when i, I don't know how what it was like in nebraska but certainly here in the uk um it was with with extreme rules when it came to lockdowns and you know you, like basically photographing another human um in an enclosed space or even outside was just, I think it was actually downright illegal at the time. So, you know, it's just not happening. So, um, you know, I did other things like shooting products, you know, for companies and stuff like that. Um, I could quite easily do that in my home, you know, um, and I didn't have to have other uh, other humans in, in the facility. Um, but I, I just found out that for me, 
I found it extremely boring because they these Fair. products just I, I photographed a lot of soap bars weirdly enough um, but these <laughs> soap bars didn't talk back it was a really shit conversation I had with them <laughs> it was terrible <laughs> so um yeah, for a social person, that would be a very a very hard thing to do. Yeah, move from photographing people to photographing objects. Yeah, it was it did work for me. It's one thing I've learned throughout the pandemic. You know, um, there's there's two two positive things that came out of the pandemic. One was this podcast, um, and the other oh thing God. was was the fact that I've realized that actually product photography is just not for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, and see, I tried I tried dog photography actually because oh, I thought okay. like oh I like dogs and you know I can. This, this is cool that I can, there's actually, and I don't know about in the UK, but dog photography is one of the few genres that still is able to get, um, they can charge like really premium prices. A lot of them do. It's a lot more common to find a pet photographer who is, you know, a luxury photographer than say a family or a newborn photographer. And I don't know if it's because it's newer to the industry and the people who have learned it have all kind of like gone along with the ones who started it's a beautiful thing though and so i was like oh mm. this is the perfect opportunity to get into a field where people are already expecting to pay a lot of money and so and yeah like i said i like dogs they're fine i don't like them as much as cats but whatever and <laughs> so i i started doing i took a couple photos of dogs and i very quickly learned that it was like not interested at all like I can't, even though toddlers are fairly, you know, nonverbal as far as like being able to have a conversation with them, I can understand a toddler and talk to a toddler way better than I can a dog. And to try to direct a dog to do what you want to do is like, forget it. I don't have, I don't have the patience for it. Yeah. I, I, you know, dog for, I never actually really thought about dog photography until I met Kaylee Greer. And, um, uh, her her dog photography is uh, it's like from another planet basically, but what really floored me was when I learned how much she could charge, and like you know people yep. fly all around the world. I was like, really? But to photograph your dog? Wow, <laughs> you know. And at first yep. I thought, you know, as I mean, I live in the UK. I'm not from the UK, but I live in the UK. And at first I thought, like, uh, that must be an American thing, surely, you know. Like nobody would do that here. That's crazy. Like you know, ten thousand dollars or something to have you. I mean, what? You know, plus plane tickets and all the rest of it, travel and so, and and then I find out, yeah, like people are that crazy. I've been crazy about my dog. I'm not ten grand crazy about my dog. I don't think. <laughs> you know, but <laughs> but obviously there are people out there, and that's you know. But that brings us back to the beginning of our conversation, yeah. you know, where we start with, well, that there's, there is a client for everyone, you know, the, oh, that's the right client for everyone. It's just about finding them. And I think that's often the talent, you know, as a, as a photographer, is actually to find the right client for you. Yeah. And I think that, like we were talking before, how you really have to put yourself visually out there as a photographer so much more now. Like, I follow people on Instagram where... 90% of their photos are photos of themselves and like at a coffee shop or, you know, like sitting on their couch or whatever. And then 10% is actually photos of their work and people love it. And it's yeah. because in this, you know, vast world of photographers, in order to, to feel justified in spending more, we really want to have this relationship with our photographer and to like feel like we kind of are on the same level and we get each other and you know we're doing this creative thing and we're on the same plane as far as what we want to create what we want to do um and so yeah it's just that uh i don't know i i i I lost my train of thought as far as where, where we're going with that <laughs> where, what were we talking about oh, i would say the kind the of just you know the, the need to self everyone. Yeah. And it's the need to self market. Yeah, so um, you know, in the headshot space, uh, you know, Peter Hurley is a really good example for like self marketing, you know. Um, and it's, it, yeah, I mean, it, if if you happen to have the personality, you know, then that's great. But a lot of people just, you know, they're not necessarily that interested in, it, I mean, in themselves in a way, you know. Um, they're just a bit more interested um, in, in the work, which is, you know, maybe, I don't know, it's a little bit more difficult. I, f I find it, that's definitely, like we said before, you know, it's definitely one of the main, one of the major changes between the industry in the past and and uh, where the industry is at the moment is, is that sort of constant need, 
you know, to feed the social media dragon, you know, and uh, and create all that all that kind of content. Um, I, I mean, I have to admit, even personally, I, th I think I've fallen victim to that um, for a while, and then I sort of checked out of that. <laughs> like, um, you know, nobody should ever check out my personal Instagram account. There's really nothing much on there at all. No, um, I hear you. My own, my own photography business. I, I literally started my Instagram account about six months ago, and there's like maybe twenty photos on there. Like, I don't. I just, it's exhausting. Like, and yeah. I don't know if any of the photos on there are of me, because like, I don't feel like I should have to do that. I feel like my work should speak for itself, and that's why people should come to me. But that's not the reality of it. It's, you know, somehow you have to be able to show that you have a specific personality that's unique, that these people who are looking for a photographer, they go to your website or they see your video and they're just like, this is the person. Like there is nobody else. This is the one because they're exactly what I want. And that's when they're able to throw out all that extra money is because they have, they have made a connection with you. And a lot of times that connection anymore doesn't come from just like seeing a pretty photo that you've taken. It comes from learning about that person. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's it's just, it's just as important to to know who you're working with um, as as it is to to know what the finished work is. Um, but now that we've we've sort of covered the the idea of pricing um, quite extensively, I want to talk about um, Happily Ever Photo, which is um, which is an online. Well, how would you describe it? I just, I describe it as a, an online directory for photographers. But give me your sort of helicopter view of uh, of Happily Ever Photo and and what that actually is for our listeners. Yeah. So like you said, it's an online photographer directory, but it's a directory of photographers of any portrait genre. So from dogs to boudoir, to wedding, to newborns, to branding, um, all along the spectrum. It is right now only for US based photographers. So I apologize, but that's where I started. Um, and what makes us unique is a couple different things. One of the things is that we have a lot of different filters on the directory that you can't use any other search engine or directory to filter your results by. So we have a filter for editing style. So whether you want, you know, a photographer who edits in a moody style or a light and airy style or a true to life style, we have several different ones that you can pick from. And then we also have like, you know, a pop-up that shows you examples. Cause I understand that all general public doesn't even know what a lot of those mean. Um, but we have a direct or sorry, a filter where you can go by experience. So how many years in the business do they have? Um, obviously a location filter. So what state are they in? What part of the state are they in? What do they specialize in? We have a check mark for, I want a specialist, which means that this photographer only does one or two genres as opposed to, you know, five or six, which a lot of photographers do. Um, and there are certain industries where people are really looking for a specialist, like boudoir, like dogs, like newborns, you know, where that's really important to them. So we have that as a filter. There's there's more, um, but you can use all these filters to really hone in on the people that match exactly what you want. And each listing has three portfolio photos from the photographer. You can contact them directly through the site. You can go to their website from our website. Um, and the photographers, the second thing that makes us unique is the photographers who are on the directory have had to demonstrate that they charge profitable rates to be listed on the directory at all. And I think, I mean, as far as I know, I'm the only directory that has required that. And I, being a photographer myself, I'm sure has, you know, colored my view on that. But I don't want to be sitting here advertising photographers who are offering $50 mini sessions because that doesn't help our industry. So I'm, as a requirement for signing up, they have to either send me their pricing guide or send me to the link on their web page where it shows their pricing to show that they're charging a minimum amount, you know, depending on the genre that they shoot to be listed on the directory. So those are kind of the differentiating factors that we have there. How did you come up with that, with that idea? <laughs> um, well, it, it was kind of twofold. One is that I am a picky client when it comes to finding our own photographers. And I found it really tough to just get on like Google and like narrow down the photographers that were exactly what I wanted. 
And a lot of times it had to do with maybe editing style or the fact that they were, you know, specialists in what they were doing. Cause I just, I don't want to go and get my wedding photo or get my, yeah, get my wedding photos done by someone who shoots weddings and newborns and families and dogs and, you know, on and on and on. I wanted someone who was a specialist. Um, and then also when I was at a networking event several years ago, someone came up to me and they said, Hey, we fell in love with a specific wedding photographer in town who shoots this very, um, like brand specific style. It was, you know, kind of like that moody and muted, everybody is orange <laughs> style. Um, <laughs> and, um, they fell in love with her editing style, but for whatever reason, she couldn't take their photos. I can't remember why, but so they were on the hunt for another photographer who shot similar to, to her. And they asked me if I knew anyone who did. And at the time, now I can name, you know, five or 10 in my area, but at the time it was kind of a new editing style and I didn't know anyone who did it. So I was like, well, no, I don't, but I can find someone. So I, you know, went on Facebook and do a photography community and said, this is what she's looking for. Send me your website. I looked through their stuff and then I took the ones who really matched what she was looking for and emailed those to her, which was cool, but it was exhausting. Like there was no other way for her to do that, you know, to find that person other than literally just like Googling all these people are getting on their website and seeing if their style, you know, matches what she's looking for. So, um, yeah, it was twofold. It was kind of something like that. And me thinking, man, that would be really cool to have a way to search for photographer in that way. And then also my own selfish desires to be able to, you know, when you have an idea of you, what you want to be able to quickly find that. And most directories are wedding photographer specific there aren't really any well-known ones that are for any other genre other than weddings. So it was a kind of a need in the market that I saw. Fantastic. I mean, how long did it take you to, to find all these photographers in the first place? Oh God, that's so, uh, I don't know. I didn't calculate the hours. I don't want to calculate the hours because honestly it would be incredibly depressing, but I spent, I don't know, at least six straight months just going onto like Google Maps and saying, okay, today I'm going to look at Detroit and I'm going to look at the wedding photographers and I'm going to click on their websites and try to find their contact information. And then I'm going to compile this Excel spreadsheet of all of these email addresses. And then I'm going to literally one by one by one send individual emails out to these photographers and i started off where it, to be now it's very cheap still to be listed but in the beginning it was free because of course i'm not going to charge photographers to be on something that there are no other photographers on and nobody knows about like why would they pay for that um so in the beginning it was free i can't believe that so many people even opened the email much less clicked on the link much less oh, yeah. filled out the whole form to be listed, you know, because there's so many scams nowadays and we have like this huge filter for all this spam. And so, yeah, I was, I was so thankful for the people who responded, but it was, you know, a single percentage point of the amount of emails that I sent out. And it was just months and months and hours and hours and hours of doing that. Cause I, and I did reach out to like specific state organizations, you know, like the professional photographers of Nebraska sent a letter to their president, you know, or something. The vast majority of those never responded. Um, so yeah, um, almost all of it was my individual emails to photographers and then word of mouth. Once those people joined, it was a lot, it was a lot of work. And I created the website myself because I made a deal well, with myself that I wasn't going to do it unless I could, unless I could do the website myself because to pay someone to make what I made in, I don't know, $20,000 or more. And I was well. not able or willing to pay that much. So I was like, okay, I'm going to get on, you know, this platform and I'm going to see if it's even possible to create what I want to create. And, um, that in and of itself also was months and months of months of learning on my part, but then also back and forth with the the website platform to make sure that what I wanted was even available. And, um, yeah, a long time, long story short, a long time. Wow. That sounds, I mean, that sounds exhausting. <laughs> it, it was, I, I mean, I will say 
that I started it kind of in my slow season. And I would just sit there on my computer, you know, in front of a TV show at night and just sit there on Google Maps and collect these, you know, names and stuff. So that part was fairly mindless, but it was a lot of hours, that's for sure. So do you, do you ever do you have a slow season in like newborn photography generally? Or? Not so much in newborns, but in family photography, like the spring and the fall or when everyone wants photos. And so, yeah, like January to March is usually very slow. Usually the, oh, the summer is slow because people are gone. Okay. Um, so what are the requirements that you, you mentioned, um, you mentioned something to do with pricing. Um, what are the general requirements for anybody who would want to join that directory? Well, first of all, you have to have a website. So we don't accept anyone who just has like a social media page. I'm not saying that there aren't some crazy exceptions of photographers who don't have websites, um, who are real professionals, but I think it's few and far between. So you do have to have a website. Um, and then the pricing again, depends on what genre you're in, but like to give you an example, the wedding photography. So for like an eight hour wedding, the, the very minimum is $2,500 to charge for that. And then, so we have like four different tiers that you classify yourself as, and it's not a filtering choice. So like when someone goes on and they look on the directory, they can't filter by price point. And that was something that I specifically took out as requests from the photographer. So the price point is listed on, on their profile, but you can't filter by it. Um, so, but yeah, they do have like four different tiers of pricing. So that way the public has a general idea of what it's going to cost. Um, and yeah, so 2,500 is the bare minimum for an eight hour wedding. And I absolutely know that if you live in New York city and you charge $2,500, you're not probably going to be able to live off of that. But at the same time, I could not create a specific price point for every city in the United States. So yeah. I had to come up with a general, um, a general rule. So I know that it's not going to apply to everybody, but, um, and some people could maybe shoot for less than that and somehow, you know, pay their bills. Maybe if they were in like backwater Oklahoma or something and had seven roommates and no kids and, you know, everyone lives differently. Yeah. Um, but so I, I came up with generalizations and that's how it works. This, that actually pretty much answers a question that I forgot to ask you earlier when we were talking about pricing. That was um, that had to do with uh, whether whether or not you thought it was a good idea to actually display your pricing on your website. Because I know uh, from conversations that I've had in the past, people have different opinions. Some some people say like, don't put your prices on your website um, because you want to you know you would have to direct conversation with a potential client. Um, and other people say, well, no, absolutely put your pricing on the website. What, where do you stand on that? I mean, I know obviously in order to qualify for a uh, heavily ever photo, you could have to have your prices on the website, I guess. You don't technically have to because you can send me like a pricing PDF ah. um, that you display. So you don't technically have to have them on your website. Um, where I fall personally is, is colored because as a client, I get really frustrated if I go onto a website and I can't even get like an idea of what it's gonna cost. Because not only is that just, I don't wanna waste my time or waste their time, but also then I'm just going to go ahead and assume that it's out of my price range, you know, kind of yep. like the saying, like, if you have to ask how much it costs, then you can't afford it. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, if, if someone has a website as a photographer and they don't have their pricing listed, then I just won't, I won't even pursue them. That being said, if you are in the high luxury market, I think you can get away with it because those clients who are going to come and are going to be willing to pay for you, they're used to. Um, like for an example, there's a, a really nice daycare here in town that is like very much uh, like caters to like the high end clientele. And I went onto their website just because I wanted to see what they charged in comparison to other, and you can't find it. They do not list it. Like you have to go and you have to do the tour of the place and you know, all the stuff. Um, and they can get away with it because they are very clearly catering to a high end clientele. Um, whereas I think if you're anything outside of that luxury price point. Um, I don't, I, I, th I would not advise people to not have any sort of pricing information on their site. I think, I think that's a bad idea, but I'm also a client who would be annoyed by that. So maybe I'm a little biased. Yeah, absolutely the same. I think, I don't think Andy Leibovitz has a price on her website. I actually don't think, I think she doesn't even have a website. 
That's that's got to be like super high level when you don't even have a website. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um. Uh, how how do you think how has um happily ever photo uh, contributed to to photographer's success in the past? Do you have do you have any like success stories that you could share with us? Yeah. Well, one of the things that the way that the website is made that from a business standpoint, I wish I could change. But again, from a clientele standpoint, I don't want to change is like I said, you can go onto the people's profiles and then click directly from their profile to their website. So a lot of the traffic that goes to those photographers um, goes that direction. The only way that I can track if someone is contacting a client through it is if they use our, our embedded send email form, right? Um, so I don't get all the stats that I would love to get, and I don't get to collect all of the, you know, kind of like, oh, enter your email address, and then you can do this. I get that from a business standpoint, but it would annoy me as a user, and I don't want to do that. Um, so at the moment, it's hard to track a lot of those. But one of the other ways that we promote uh, our photographers, a couple different ways, actually, um, every month we do a featured photo contest. So photographers submit their images and then I choose a certain amount, usually around a dozen or 15. Um, and through that next month, we feature these photographers on social media and on the website and on a blog post with direct links to their websites and, you know, information about them and stuff like that. So that's just kind of like free advertising that they get as part of being part of the podcast or podcast, sorry, the website. Um, and then also one of the things I just did this last month that I really enjoyed was we did some collaboration articles that we wrote. So I came up with a topic like five red flags um, to look for when you're going to hire a photographer. And that's all I came up with. And then I asked my photographer community, if you would like to write one of these red flags, um, send me, you know, I created like a Google sheet and everyone put in their information. And then we, I put together an, an article and in each, you know, red flag, I said, this is from this photographer who shoots here. And, you know, at the end I had their profile picture and a link to their website and stuff like that. So it was like really, really good information and really cool to have it from so many different sources. So you aren't just getting like one person's you know, a process on it. But then also that article is getting shared by all of those photographers. So it's getting out to a whole lot of people. Um, and, and then obviously shared by me as well, but that was just yeah. another kind of like free marketing thing, but a lot of value added for the general public to have. So I really enjoyed doing those too. Yeah. That's a, that's a great way of, um, of doing things. I did, I did that actually. So it's something similar, um, at the beginning of the year, I think it was, uh, it was something like, um, I can't, I can't remember what the episode was. It was something yeah, like, so you know, thing uh, like the best photo tips or something by, you know, by these photographers. And I basically just, I just emailed a lot of previous guests on the show, previous like, you know, so, um, yeah. and then I had people getting back to me like Joe McNally and, um, and Pete Hurley and, you know, all with the, coming, coming back to me with some really awesome tips. And so the whole episode was really just, you know, an episode made up of, of these responses and what it actually resulted into was, was this this really cool episode of like some really awesome first-hand tips from some of the greatest photographers in the industry, which is amazing. And then of course, you know, it gets shared through all the, the social media as well, which is, which is useful. But yeah, I, I love doing these things. It's, it's great. It's just, it's great when, yeah. you know, when you can, when you can tap into the community and, and that's what I love about photography and the photography industry is there's such an incredibly friendly community. You know, I always find that when I go to trade shows, I'm over here in the UK with, with something called the Photography Show, which is probably like some, something um, akin of like WPBI or some, something like that, um, you know, the equivalent in the US. Um, but I love going to those shows because it's it's just such a great sense of community. And, you know, I, that's why, that's actually probably the, the sole reason why I'm still doing this website, uh, this website, this podcast, um, you know, after like three years or something, because it's, it's just such a great way of, yeah, of, of of tapping into the into the community uh, across the pond, as well as over here in Europe, you know, which is uh, which is such a great it's such a great connection. And speaking of the community aspect, that has been probably the main factor that's kept me when I was creating this website and putting in all this time, you know, for for no money, no nothing. 
kept me going is these photographers who would write back to me and say, what a cool idea. You know, I love what you're doing and, you know, give me feedback on it. Well, I would ask them, do you guys think I should have this filter? Or do you think, um, you know, the website should look like this? Or what what are your thoughts on, you know, adding this page or whatever? And I got so much feedback um, from these people who were just incredibly supportive and are still, we have like a private Facebook group and they're just, they're just wonderful people, you know, and if they hadn't been there, there's, there's no way I'd still be doing this. They were just, they've been wonderful. Fantastic. That's, that's really, that's so great to hear because it's, it literally is, you know, it's a, it's a great idea, um, you know, that, that is supported by, you know, by the, by the industry as such and by the, but it's, it's such a great collaborative effort. Um, and of course, you know, if, if you're listening to this or if you're watching this on YouTube and you're interested in the checking out Happily Ever Photo, um, we have all the links in the description um, and I'm also going to fly them in. If you're, if you're watching on, on YouTube, then uh, you'll see them at the bottom of the screen somewhere. So, uh, you know, make sure you check that out. And if you're interested in joining, you know, I highly recommend it. It sounds great. Um, Bonnie, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much. I mean, there's so many more things we could talk about. I'm very sure. Um, if you're okay with that, I'll have you back on the show because there's so many different things to discuss as far as, you know, as far as the business side of things are concerned. Um, Absolutely. That'd be interesting to hear, to hear your take on. So thank you so much for being our guest today. Okay, folks, that's all for today. Some amazing insights into the business side of photography from Bonnie and something I'm sure will be of great help to many of you out there. But before we go, let me just recommend another episode that I think you'll like. Check out episode 148 with Pi Jersa, where we discuss more photography business essentials. I'm sure you love it. If you enjoy our content, consider supporting us on buymeacoffee.com to help us continue creating and bringing you more exciting episodes. It really does mean the world to us. And for those of you who are listening to the audio version of this podcast, did you know that there's a fully fleshed video version on YouTube with plenty of examples of our guest's photography in full Technicolor? All you have to do is go over to YouTube, search for Camera Shake Podcast, and you'll be able to watch all past episodes on there. And if you are on YouTube already, well, get in touch and leave a comment and remember to hit the like button, ring the bell, and share with your friends. You can help us reach a greater audience all over the world. Once again, thank you for listening and watching, and I'll see you next Thursday. Thank you.